And thanks for the introduction. It's been great working with Lee over the last several years. Um, we're fortunate, children, we do have a good program. We have lots of specialists. We'll talk a little bit about the orthopedic care of your children. All right. So I want to acknowledge Lindsay Andrus. She's one of my partners. We've been working together for several years. Lindsay goes go to the MDA clinic. Uh, she does a lot of spine surgery for these kids. I don't do spine surgery anymore. Lindsay couldn't be with us today because she's at another meeting. But the cases I'll show you later with the spine deformity are her kids. So I'm going to talk about some general things just for a minute because Lee touched on most of them already. Um, some specific issues in our children. We'll talk about foot deformities, scoliosis, fractures, and then I'll wrap up. So in general, <clears throat> as you know and as Lee talked about, the orthopedist is a significant portion of the team. All of the, all of the guys do have some degree of uh, muscle and bone involvement, obviously. Lots of foot issues, back issues. So we get involved early. I would also point out that, fortunately or not, a lot of the kids come to us without a diagnosis, just like Dr. Ramos Platt talked about, and we end up making the diagnosis in many of these children. Often they're, you know, developmental delay. Sometimes I've had kids diagnosed with CP. Um, I've had other children who actually had foot surgery when they were babies and they didn't realize they had MD. So we get involved early and often and should be part of the team throughout the years. Typical problems in the foot are equinus, that's on the tippy toes, the heel cords are tight. So when they're on the tippy toes, the question is, is it really just that the heel cord is tight <clears throat> or is the child walking in that way because it's mechanically better to do so for him or her and I'll explain that in a minute. We'll talk about a varus foot, that's the foot tilted to the side, it looks like that, that's a severe case, um, but that's what a varus foot looks like. And then we want to know if it's varus, is it flexible? So equinus, they're on their tippy toes. Initially, it's not, again, that the heel cord is that tight. It's that there's a mechanical reason for that, and I'll go over that. We want to pre prevent a fixed deformity because that becomes more problematic as the time goes as far as the child's walking and also as far as getting on shoes and sitting well in a chair. Basically, what you see in a lot of the kids um, when they're on their toes is it's physics, some of us remember from physics, from every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And basically what that means is when you walk, when you push down on the ground, the ground pushes back on you. So on this cartoon on the right, the GRF, that's the ground reaction force. And basically what that means is, <clears throat> how's the ground pushing back on us? And you can see in a typical walking pattern, the ground reaction force is in front of our knees, so our knee straightens. We don't have to use our quad muscles. Any of us who have walked around, and maybe we had some sort of sadistic I had basketball coaches who were sadistic who made me walk in a crouch or, or do the iron chair for minutes. It's really hard on your quads if your knees are bent when you walk. So if you walk on your tippy toes, that pushes that force more in front of your knee. And so it makes it easier on your legs. You don't have to use your quadriceps to walk. So it's a much easier walking pattern. So even though sometimes we say, oh, we don't want him or her walking on the toes. In fact, that's often a mechanical um, advantage for that child. And this is just to show us that <clears throat> there's a long distance from that reaction force in front of our knee, helping our knee straighten. So this is a varus deformity. Um, unlike the equinus or tippy toes, which can help you walk, this doesn't help because it makes you unstable. It's sort of analogous to someone who's walking in high heels versus flats. And if you're in heels, it's harder to balance your weights forward except instead of being forward, it's off to the side, so you don't have as stable a base of support. So this is more problematic. Fortunately, it's less of an issue, less frequently an issue in the kids who are walking. Um, if you see this in kids who are walking, sometimes we will have them um, use some bracing. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. It's also important to recognize if someone has weak hip extension, um, they're more likely to stop walking within a few years. Same with weak ankle dorsiflexion, which is bending up the foot. So that's something about the foot to remember. So what do we do for these children? As Dr. Ramos Platt alluded to, we'll often do stretching. Obviously, you can do a home program. You can work with therapists. Bracing can help. Uh, we use a lot of bracing. We'll talk about that. You can do day versus night bracing. You can do casting and surgery, and we'll talk about all of these. 
So for the Aquinas, ROM's range of motion. So you think about night splinting when the children are starting to lose some of that range. This is one type of splint. There are a variety of types of splints you can use at night. Uh, Dr. Ramos talked about AFOs. O is orthotic, AF is ankle foot. So it's just a way to immobilize your ankle and foot. Daytime bracing I don't use very frequently personally because what I find is in a lot of the kids, number one, sometimes that tippy toes can help them keep their knees straighter. Number two is if you have a brace on, <clears throat> beside the fact that it doesn't let you go into that equinus or tippy toes, it makes you wear a bigger, heavier, bulkier shoe and longer shoe and sometimes tripping is more frequent. So I think you need to keep your range. I don't think you necessarily need to wear a brace in the daytime. Sometimes we'll do serial casting for children who are uh, having more tightness despite our best efforts without doing casting. Varus is a little different. Um, you do consider night splinting when these are flexible problems. Daytime bracing, rarely needed, but sometimes in a child who's in varus, who doesn't have a stable base of support, you want to put a brace on to make him or her more stable. And by brace, it doesn't have to be a hard plastic brace like we showed here. Sometimes the lace-up ankle brace that you see athletes wear, those are pretty helpful because they'll allow some flexibility, some support. They don't need a bigger shoe. They're not very heavy. And you can get those on places like Amazon for about $20 a piece. And this is just to remind us that people are often using their toe walking because of what we talked about earlier. So treatment, what about surgery? It's controversial. When I was training, my mentors did a lot of surgery for these kids and their feet. Um, that hasn't been shown to be very helpful. The pros, you can maybe slightly prolong walking. If you look at the series in kids who had surgery for ability to walk, you might prolong walking a few months, um, but that's a bit controversial. Some studies it was a month or two, some it was six or eight, but it's a surgery and there are risks to it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The foot alignment's better. The cons, um, it's a surgery. No one likes having surgery. I'm a surgeon. I like to avoid surgery too for my kids when I can. There are anesthetic risks. Lee talked earlier about malignant hyperthermia and there are some other risks too. And just like Lee talked about, you want to be at a center where they take care of kids frequently who have problems your child has. The anesthesiologists are a big part of that and they need to know about malignant hyperthermia. There's protocols that are, we have at our place that they use for anyone who's at any risk for MH. There was a study that one of our former fellows did when she was in uh, Canada. She did this at, at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Canada. They looked at non-ambulatory children with uh, DMD and they compared patients who had foot surgery to those who didn't and they wanted to know what difference does it make in those children. So when the children had surgery, they had less tightness, their heel cords. They didn't have surgery. They actually had more motion in their hind foot, meaning when you tilted their foot in and out side to side, there was more flexible. And then if you looked and compared the group, they were equal as far as their ability to wear shoes, pain, cosmesis, how it looked, and if they were sensitive and what their satisfaction rate was. So there were very little benefits to doing surgery in these kids uh, even though that had traditionally been advocated for all of them. If you do surgery, and I'm a surgeon, I do surgeries all the time, but for kids with DMD, I've only had to do one surgery in a child for his foot in the last 19 years, and that's because I couldn't talk the family out of it after multiple sessions. I didn't think he had to have it. Mom felt really strongly and we talked a lot and we ultimately did it. But if you do it, you need to get them up right away. You guys know that the mobilization is a big problem. So get people up on their feet immediately. Um, if you do a surgery, you usually do a heel cord lengthening and you often do something to split what's called the posterior tibial tendon to balance the forces. But even if you do this, they should be up on their feet literally within 24 hours after surgery, up in a stander, or if they can take some steps, et cetera. You do not get these, let these kids sit around. So next I want to talk about scoliosis. Um, and that obviously is something everyone here has heard about and knows about. I want to mention, hopefully you can see on the picture on your right, that 
scoliosis is not just a side-to-side -side curve, it's a three-dimensional curve, so you'll see a rotation, and so you'll see prominence of the ribs on one side. Some people call it a rib hump. The point is there's a rotation, there's asymmetry, and you will see that. It's rare in the kids who are ambulatory. It's important to remember that it's hard to detect small curves clinically. So you can look at the child, but sometimes it's hard to tell. Once a child is wheelchair bound, we get x-rays of their spine every six months to follow it closely because we'll talk later about the difference between doing something early and late. It's typically associated with what's called kyphosis. That's a hunch forward, a side to side, leaning forward of the back. The natural history, these tend to progress pretty quickly um, if someone's going to progress. They progress a couple degrees a month, and that's why we don't want to wait more than about six months between x-rays. If you wait a year and a half and it's changed two degrees a month, that's 36 degrees. So it, it can change quickly. Every six months, it's not a big change. Bracing doesn't tend to work with this. Um, it doesn't tend to work in a lot of kids with different nerve and muscle diseases because the cause isn't gravity or the position. The cause is the muscle weakness and imbalance. It's also important to remember, and Dr. Ramos Platt touched on this, is as a child is getting older and the curve is getting bigger, there can be negative implications for their, for their heart and their lungs. And so that's another reason that if we're thinking of surgery, we do something earlier than later, and we'll talk about that. So this article a few years ago showed that in people treated with steroids, mark a diminution in the rate of progression of scoliosis. So if you don't get steroids, the vast majority of kids will have progression. And those who did have steroids, it really slows it down. That's another reason to talk to your physician about steroids and see, you know, if, you, if your child can tolerate them. Treatment, you do observation um, in, the non, in the ambulatory, but also the non-ambulatory kids. You think about surgery when the curve is small, it's 20 or 30 degrees. That's very different than what we do think about for surgery with kids with other conditions. Kids who don't have any conditions at all, we think when they're 50 or 60 degrees. Kids who have other nerve and muscle diseases, we think bigger curves. And I'll explain why we do it in smaller curves in the younger, in the kids with DMD. Larger curves, it's a bigger surgery, longer surgery, more blood loss, more complications. And there are multiple studies which have shown this, shown this from multiple centers throughout the country and world. What are the benefits? Well, it prevents progression of scoliosis. It allows someone to sit upright for longer. It's easier for the caregivers and for the young man or woman. And it avoids some of the negative impacts on pulmonary or lung function in these children. And it may improve or slow the decline of what's called their forced vital capacity, another measure of lung function. This is a slide from an article where you basically see on the bottom curve the decrease if they didn't have surgery and a, a slower decrease if there were surgery as far as lung function goes. As far as the impact on survival, we don't have those data yet. And these are from uh, this study in particular. What other benefits? And this is a study that a well-known spine surgeon back east published a couple years ago. Basically, he looked at kids who had DMD. He prospectively enrolled them. They looked at their lung function, and there was a group who had surgery and a group who didn't. Surgery was recommended, but they decided against it. The family did. Um, and this is, again, a measure of lung function. And what we looked at it, or they looked at it, final follow-up was the group who had surgery had about 40% higher uh, lung capacity than the non-surgical group. And then they looked at how much did the lung capacity decrease, and there was a smaller decrease in the surgical group. So, uh, same author, and basically they were looking at quality of life, and they showed some improvement in quality of life scores in the surgical versus the non-surgical group. This is not saying if your child has a curve, he has to have surgery. This is saying this is why we recommend surgery, and obviously it's a family decision what you do. Every person, every family has to make his or her choice, but these are the types of data that support why I send my kids to Lindsay 
Andrus to do the surgery when they get curves of 20 or 30 degrees. And again, I'll show you some pictures now um, of some other anecdotal cases. So this is from a well-known orthopedic text. These are two brothers of Duchesne's. One had surgery and the other didn't because of his lung function. You can see the difference in their positioning. You can see on the child on your right, that rotation that we talked about earlier. And it's obviously much easier for the child who's straight to sit up and much harder for the other child. But there are risks to it. Obviously, there are anesthetic risks. We talked earlier about uh, malignant hyperthermia. These kids lose a fair amount of blood. They can be intubated or have a breathing tube in for days. Um, wound healing problems. Infection can certainly happen. And this is from one of these studies, but this is what we all see. The kids also do lose more blood than the average child when we're doing a spine fusion surgery. And there are a lot of reasons. The dissection, meaning when we get down to the spine, the muscles are firmer, just like you can feel the calf muscles are firmer. It's the same with the muscles around the spine. So it's a little harder to get down there. Um, platelet function isn't normal, so they bleed a little. The platelets uh, help us clot. Normally when we do spine surgery, we keep the kid's blood pressure really low so that there's less bleeding. But because of the kid's uh, heart uh, status, we can't uh, lower the blood pressure as much safely. And again, that's why we have special anesthesiologists. Not only do we have at our place anesthesiologists who take care of kids with MD all the time, but also we have a specific spine team because this is what they do on a daily basis. Um, right now our team is doing over 300 spine fusions a year, um, not just for DMD of course, but <clears throat> it's really key that you go to a place where they take care of the problem you have a lot. We all know that. You don't take whatever your car is, is some guy, you take it to whoever knows about that particular car. You, you go to the best skin doctor, neurologist, heart surgeon you, you can get to. And there's also, because of um, the difficulty of vasoconstriction, meaning the, the arteries closing down, you know, when you cut yourself, you stop bleeding pretty quickly because your arteries close down quickly. This doesn't happen as well in the kids with DMD. Pre-op, it's a team effort. The neurologist, you get number one billingly. <laughs> um, nutritionist, make sure they have good nutritional reserves. Pulmonologists, make sure the lungs are good, and the cardiologist. So everyone looks at these kids, make sure that they're optimized, they're good to go, and any specific recommendations that we need. And I would add that post-op, we have a great team of intensivists because <clears throat> they're key in this. The surgery is the surgery, and we do our thing, but it's the team that takes care of your child, and every family is a huge part of that, of course. So when you're in the hospital, if you have this or anything, Having the family at the bedside as much as possible is key because <clears throat> you, you know when your child's having an issue and you can be with them 24 hours and you can be the eyes and ears <clears throat> for our nursing staff as well. I want to show three of Lindsay's cases to show you why we like to do these surgeries earlier than later. So this is a child, 12-year-old, wheelchair bound. He has a 40-degree curve. It's flexible. Um, his pelvis is tilted, kyphosis, that hunch we talked about. When you have a curve that's that magnitude, they're flexible. So it's easy to straighten those curves. And this is the result Lindsay got. This is one of the children I sent to her a few months ago. And you can see how straight he is. And I'll show you later. I'll compare these three cases. Second case, older child. They had been declining. The family didn't want surgery because it's scary. Um, and, but then ultimately, because he was so tilted, he was getting some skin problems. And so at this point, the curve, instead of being 40, was 105. <clears throat> he had been on BiPAP at night because the lung function wasn't as good. And it still had some flexibility. <clears throat> so it's not just how big is the curve, but how flexible is it. <clears throat> so Lindsay did his surgery. He's a lot straighter, not quite as straight as the other guy, but looks pretty good. He was in the hospital a week instead of four days for the other child. And we get to this one. This is a child who's in a wheelchair for five years, had had surgery recommended for several years. And at this point, his curve was also 100, but it was really stiff. So what we mean by stiff is you can literally push the curve straight in some kids and others you can't. 
and in him you couldn't straighten it at all. And so Lindsay did his surgery. He looks a lot better, but not like the other two. But these are longer surgeries, more blood loss, limited correction. So these are the three cases, left to right, smaller curve, more flexible, up to bigger curve, rigid. For the flexible little curves, our partners can do those surgeries in two or three hours. For the bigger curves, it's a six or seven or eight hour surgery. So it's a big difference. Yeah. Are there long-term complications with the herring rod or mobility in certain So there's a question of if you use a Harrington rod, are there long-term complications as far as mobility, et cetera? Basically, um, there are different instrumentation techniques. These are a little different than the Harrington, which is a pure distraction, but the concept of doing a spine fusion is you lose motion at the segments which were fused, but even in people who are walking around who have other conditions we operate on, even if we fuse their whole spine down to the pelvis, like in these kids, they can still walk. Um, so there are not long-term implications for this as far as limiting your child's function or quality of life now. So fractures this is our final thing we'll talk about. And Lee talked about how up to 40% of kids get fractures. This is a particular study we're looking at where about 20% a, a did. The point is a lot of these kids get fractures. Um, this is one of my kids. These are a couple of his fractures. In this particular series, about half of them happened in kids who were ambulating, so walking. And so if it's someone who's walking, get them up as fast as you can. <clears throat> Put them in a cast or a brace or something where you can walk that child. Because about 20% of the kids, at least in this study, who had a fracture stopped walking afterward. So you need to make sure you get them up walking. In the children who aren't walking, you just want to splint them so the fracture, the break can heal and so they're comfortable. So in summary, foot deformities, Night braces to prevent contractures. Day braces are rarely needed. Surgery almost never. <clears throat> it may slightly prolong walking, but there are risks and doesn't improve their quality of life. Scoliosis, less common if treated with steroids. Early fusion is a safer surgery. Better lung function and quality of life scores if surgery is done than if it's not. Fractures, if they're walking kids, mobilize them early, get them up, get them on their feet. If they don't walk, do some sort of immobilization so they're comfortable, so the bone can heal, and so they're going to be able to have a good quality of life. Thank you very much. We have a couple minutes for questions. You got a question? <laughs> So the question is that her, I'm sorry, this, this, this one isn't working. Oh, I, I, her, mom's question was that her child has, is about 18, has a 40 or 50 degree curve, hasn't really changed. Is there a laser surgery for scoliosis? They've been kind of debating. There are no laser surgeries for scoliosis. The rods are in place to align the spine, hold it aligned while the bone that's put in lets it heal. But no, there aren't um, laser surgeries for it. Um, so what I would say is if you're contemplating surgery, talk to someone where they do a lot and they can tell you what do they anticipate, how long is the surgery, what would the blood loss be, what's the anticipated hospital stay. The problem is <clears throat> if, if nothing is done, there's in a 40 to 50 degree curve, a high chance it will progress subsequently, but everyone is different, so you can't say for sure. You had a question? So I, I want to try to avoid fractures. I'm wondering if you have any metrics on what activities the kids usually are participating in when the fractures occur. Are they usually walking? Are they you know, playing? Are they sports or something? So the question is, Dad wants to know if we have any metrics of when are these kids getting fractures if they have fractures. So most of the kids I've seen who have had fractures have been from falling in whatever circumstance they're doing. Um, I would reiterate what Dr. Ramos Plot said, check their bone densities, get them on vitamin D, and then if their bone densities are really low, potentially supplement that with something the endocrinologist would need like a bisphosphonate. But I don't have specific metrics on exactly what things the kids are doing. In my kids, most of the time it's been that they've fallen 
and broken. Sometimes it's walking. I've had some kids fall out of chairs. I've had other kids who were getting wheeled and their foot wasn't on the foot plate and it got caught on something. So there are a variety of ways it can happen, but it's typically not um, just you're doing something and you break because it's stressing the bone too much. It's usually a fall or some mechanical event which happens. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. I guess we're up to the... Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, is the DEXA scan, is this a measure of bone density controversial? No, getting bone density is not controversial. There are different types of tests you can do. There's a DEXA, there's a quantitative CT, there are various ways to do it. But I don't think there's any controversy that you should quantitate what your child's bone density is because the lower that bone density is, the higher risk of fracture. And they do something called the Z-score, which is how many standard deviations below normal it is. And once you're getting more than two or three standard deviations below normal, that's a big problem. And how often can you do the bone How often can you do bone density? As Dr. Ramos Platt has uh, indicated at our institution, we do it every year. We think that's what you should be doing. Yes. So the question is about fat embolism syndrome and the risks that DMD kids have with that. Um, we haven't seen that our institution. Um, tend to, when we tend to see fat embolism, at least as a surgeon, is when we're putting something in the bone. Um, but I haven't personally seen that. Have you seen that, Lee? Or? So, okay, so uh, Dr. Ramos Platt said that we have had one at our institution when he was traveling. But I haven't seen it personally. So the question is that her child has osteoporosis, so his bone density is not good, and that um, but he's on BiPAP. So we st all the kids have not good bone density. So again, you want to talk to your surgeon. You saw the x-rays. They got many, many different points of fixation. You, there are about 20 or 25 screws in those because the bone's not good, so you distribute the force evenly, and you need a pulmonary evaluation before and a cardiology evaluation before. So we have to go to break now, but I can answer the questions people had. I'm just going to ask about yeah. the ankle cord. About the ankle? So, you know, the ankle cord. Oh, so mom is saying the heel cords are tight. What about the toes being tight? It's common that the toe flexors are tight. So if you have your AFO brace at night that includes, goes out past the toes and has a pad under them, that will stretch out the, he the clawing of the toes. Pardon me? There is a surgery you can do to loosen those, but that's rarely necessary. But if you do that, you can do it through the same incision. You do a heel cord surgery, and it adds two or three minutes to add that toe flexor part. Oh, okay, last. Yes. Inverting. So mom asked, her child's feet tend to invert, and he has braces that go up to his ankles. And also, like you were saying, the bigger shoes make him fall more, so he's falling more. Right, so he's falling more with the bigger shoes. What I would say is, um, I haven't seen your child, everyone's a little different, but I would try to do a brace. If he needs it for inverting, I would try to use just a, like a lace-up ankle brace that will give him some support that doesn't require a longer shoe that can fit in a normal size shoe. And I would let him walk on his toes because he's using that to substitute for weak quadriceps. Okay, thanks.